uh, USA Today conducted a uh, survey several years ago where they uh, asked Americans in the top 1% income bracket how much they'd be willing to spend on three of these intangible items. Great intellect, true love, and a place in heaven. And so according to the super wealthy, they'd be willing to spend an average of $407,000 for great intellect, $487,000 for true love, and $640,000 for a place in heaven. Now, most of us are probably don't have that kind of money, but the sentiment is the same, right? And particularly for the third category, I mean, most of us, we would be willing to do whatever it takes to, to ensure a spot in heaven. And so that's an important question that we ask here often is like simply like, what do we have to do or, you know, in order to get to heaven? A Sunday school teacher asked uh, her class that question one day, and she began by saying this. She said, class, if I sold my house and my car and I had a big garage sale and gave all my money to the church, would I go to heaven? Would that get me into heaven? And all the children said, no. Well, she said, well, what if I cleaned the church every day, mowed the yard, and kept everything neat and tidy? Would I then get into heaven? And again, the kids all said no. And then the Sunday school teacher said, okay, then how can I get into heaven? And one of the uh, kids back in the back, a little five-year-old, shouted, you got to be dead first. <laughs> Well, we've been studying through the book of Romans for several weeks now, and, and Paul, who's the author, has been talking about salvation and ultimately where our confidence lies as it pertains to eternal life. And last week, if you watched or hear or, or you were with us, we saw those two glorious words at the beginning of chapter 8 in the book of Romans, where he says, no condemnation. In other words, Paul says up to this point in his letter, like what's the conclusion? Man's heart is corrupt. Sin is still causing problems. The wages of sin is death. But because of Jesus and what he has done for us, he says we have victory. Because of Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation. And that's such good news and hopefully encouraging to you even still today. But the problem is, is that even after you hear scripture like that, or you read it, or even maybe even a sermon like last week, as the days go by, we become less and less confident. I mean, as the days go by, we're tempted to slip back into our old way of thinking. And rather than put our hope in Jesus and his goodness and his work, we resort back to things that are more in our control, right? We resort back to the, this premise of like salvation, eternal life. This has to be kind of about me and, and what I'm doing. And this plays out typically in a few ways. The most obvious one is the way that Paul's been saying all throughout the book of Romans, the one he's been trying to rebuke all throughout, that this idea that salvation comes somehow by good works. Back in 2006, Warren Buffett announced that, he'd, that he was giving his fortune away to charity. Buffett at the time was worth $44 billion just in stocks. But he was going to give $37 billion of that away, mostly to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I read that when he had presented his gift to the Gates, that he made this remark. He said, there's more than one way to get into heaven but this is a great way. Now, I admit that that is impressive, to give that kind of money away. But is that really what it takes to get now? And if that's what it takes, you and I are in trouble because we don't have that kind of money, right? But again, the message of Romans and all throughout Scripture is the opposite, there aren't many ways to get to, he to heaven. Salvation is only possible because of the atoning death of Jesus and your subsequent faith in Him. Tim Keller says it like this, The universal religion of humankind is we develop a good record and give it to God, and then He owes us. But the gospel is God develops a good record and gives it to us, and then we owe Him. 
But time and time again, we wonder, like, are our deeds going to be good enough? Is our goodness going to be good enough? And I think that's kind of the most common default position that we slip back into. Another thing that people are tempted to hold on to, that maybe our salvation is somehow linked to, doctrinal purity. In other words, the fact that we know the Bible really, really well, or maybe we uh, are part of the most superior Christian denomination or non-denomination, well, that gives me more assurance of salvation. Now, we work really hard here at being a doctrinally pure church. Uh, we believe that all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching and correcting and rebuking and training in righteousness. And it's really important for you as a follower of Christ to know his word, to abide in it. It's important to know what is true. It's important to be able to rightly interpret scripture, to be good stewards of God's word. I can't stress enough the importance for you to know and understand scripture and, and God's word for your life and, and how important it is you know, for your spiritual growth. But getting an A in systematic theology doesn't earn your salvation. In fact, it's very possible to have a great handle on Scripture and yet miss the heart of God. Just read the Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You, you'll, you'll encounter a group of people called the Pharisees. These were the, the, uh, the most religious people of Jesus' day. They were the, the leading group. And they knew the Scriptures, but they didn't know the author of Scriptures. And it led to legalism and divisiveness. And, and the Messiah was in their midst and they didn't even recognize him. Knowing the word of God will give you confidence. I'll even go as far as saying that if you'll read the Bible on a daily basis, it'll transform your life. Studies show that's true. But that's not where your salvation lies. And so you probably think, well, yeah, preacher, I, 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 we know this, right? We get this. You talk about this a lot. This has to be about my faith, right? Right? That's where my confidence lies. And of course, that's at least the partially correct response, right? I mean, Ephesians 2.8 says that we are saved by grace through faith, right? And so placing your trust in the work of Jesus is how we respond to good news, no doubt about it. But even this can be misleading if we aren't careful, because we can read a passage like that and think all of a sudden it's up to me again. Like all of a sudden this becomes about my strength and my faith and my doing. And you may even be tempted to look down on someone who has less faith than you, who takes less risk, who gives less money you, because you trust God more. But we know, and again, we've been reading this all throughout the book of Romans, that we can't be the object of our own faith. Jesus has to be. You will never have enough faith faith to save yourself your faith will never be pure enough or authentic enough and i'm not trying to take anything away from you some of you have a great amount of faith and you have blessed me as a result of it but if this is solely about you and your ability to trust god wholeheartedly i hope you never waver like i hope you don't have seasons of doubt i hope you don't uh, you know i hope you don't waver in times of trials and suffering and so I know that we're tempted to resort back to this mindset that we've got to do something to help Jesus out, that grace can't be enough, but it is. Our job is just to believe and trust. And so in these next few verses, as Romans chapter 8, Paul wants to give you some assurance. Paul wants to give you some assurance that he wants to set your spirit at ease with the Holy Spirit, right? That you are a child of God. And he does this by showing us three ways that God affirms in his heart, uh, affirms our hearts that we are his children. And so look with me at Romans chapter 8, and we're going to begin at verse 13 again this week. Paul writes, For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, uh, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Now, notice that the first thing we discover here is that you can be confident because you are led by God's Spirit. And we talked about this last week, but let's go back to it because it's an important theme here. That the presence of God's Spirit directing and leading your life should remind you that you're a child of God. 
And of course, conversely, the same thing would be true, that if you are not living by the Spirit, your life is led ultimately by your own flesh, your sinful nature, then you are not a child of God. Look at that phrase. He says, putting to death the deeds of the body. Now, this has traditionally been called mortification. It means that we kill or destroy. It means exactly what it sounds like, right? That's what we do with our old life, with our old way of sin. We cut that junk out. It was killing us. We mortify it. Think about uh, a rebellious college freshman out on his own for the first time in life, and he turns his back on his past, the way he was raised, right? And so he was determined he's going to get away from all that. He was, he was raised in a good family, went to church, whatever, but, but he, he was going to you know, set out a new identity, new values. So he throws himself in becoming a completely different person, cuts away his old self, a new self emerges. That's mortification. It, that's mortification. And at the opposite, it's the opposite end of the spectrum for what God wants for us, but it's the same process. Whether we, we do it for our sinful nature, like that college freshman, or we do it by pursuing a new life in the Spirit. Can you imagine how different your life would look if you set out with the same vengeance as a college freshman who is living to satisfy his flesh, but instead you set out with that vengeance to please Christ? I mean, how different would your life look? How many headaches would you avoid? How much easier would you sleep at night or be able to look in yourself in the mirror? Sin promises to add so much value, but it just complicates things and it robs you from the life that God wants you to know. Ainley Stanley says that sin's always, sin always has a gotcha and it's always going to get you. And he's right. And that's what Paul's been saying to these followers of Jesus. He said, look, followers of Jesus ruthlessly cut that junk out of your life. Uh, you don't want that stuff hanging around. It's trying to kill you. You make the major changes that, you know, what you watch, what you listen to, the people you spend your, the, you know, your time with. And we've been saying, and he said in Romans 7, that doesn't mean that sin's going to be absent. You're still going to stumble. You're still going to battle. You're still going to face trials but the di big difference is is that sin that used to be on the calendar no longer is and your obligations to jesus now and his will and his life and that ought to give you great confidence that you are a child of his look what else paul says in verse 15 he says the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again rather the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Now the second reason that you can be confident this morning is because you've been adopted. You've been adopted. When you place your faith in Christ, he adopts you into his family and you receive all the privileges that comes with it. That term sonship implies that you, we've been given full rights as a natural born male would have been given in this culture, right? Right? And that would have included inheritance rights. And that's the language that Paul uses here and elsewhere as he describes our relationship with God. Begin because of what Jesus has done, we have been adopted into God's family. And upon his death, Jesus' death, we've received an inheritance that's fit for a king. And I think it's interesting that of the most overtly descriptive word did you know this that the bible uses to describe god isn't what we might think it isn't holy divine just good or even love those are all great ways to describe god but the term that's most used more frequently over 100 times in the new testament alone is father god is described as a father and depending upon your relationship with your earthly father, it's easy or it may be difficult to think of God in these terms. If your father was absent or angry or difficult to please, uh, I'm sorry. It's, you're going to have to work harder to understand your heavenly father that he isn't like that. He's here for you. He cares about you. He's patient with you. He loves you passionately. Do you see the word that Paul used here to describe our relationship with God? Check this out. He uses the word Abba. 
Abba. Other than Jesus himself, nowhere in Scripture is there a record of someone addressing God as Abba. It's a very intimate term. The, the word Abba is an Aramaic word that would, that's used today for daddy or papa. Again, if you were to go to parts of the Middle East today, you'll hear children referring to their fathers like this way. Uh, Abba, Abba, right? They're saying daddy, daddy. It's the least formal word for father. And incredibly, this is how God wants us to think of him. He says that we have been adopted by him. He is our Abba, Father, Daddy. You know, having adopted a child of my own makes me appreciate these references to our adoption, our adoption into God's family a, a little bit more. Um, many of you know our adoption story. I've, I've shared it uh, here at the church uh, probably a couple times now. If you hang out, if you're, if you're around for years to come, I'll probably continue to share it. Um, but uh, I, do you mind if I tell it again? Um, on March 14th in 2008, Jenny and I traveled to Bangalore, India, which is uh, Bangalore is in the southern part of the country. We were in the northern part as well, but we, we traveled there, and that's where Macy was at. And we went to Bangalore, and we, we uh, didn't know what to expect. I'd never been to an orphanage before, uh, especially in a foreign country, and we were really nervous. And, and when we get to the orphanage, we, we meet the lady who runs everything, and, and she takes us kind of in the upstairs room and where we sit down and, and take care of some, a, a few other things. But, but they also have a meal prepared for us, and it was the best meal that we had in, in all of India. It was so good. Jenny had been reading all these message boards and all these horror stories of people getting sick off of the food. We were scared to eat anything. And so this meal was so good. I mean, we, we found a pizza hut there in Bangalore. It was close to what we have here. So we lived off that and little Debbie cakes that we smuggled into the country. But, and I know all of you who love Indian food, you're thinking, are you kidding me? You missed out on all of that. I, I know, blame, blame my wife. But after the meal, we're taking down these steps to this basement where all the kids are at, and, and there's kids there really of all different ages, and, and it breaks your heart. Um, but, but our minds were, were on our daughter, Macy, and, and we had pictures, but this was the first time seeing her, and she was sitting up in this high chair, and they were feeding her something that looked like oatmeal or uh, grits or something. It did not look good at all. And her first reaction when she saw us, she took her, her arm and she covered up her eyes and went like this. She shook her head no. It was like immediately she, I mean, we, I don't know why she looked at us and said that, but it was just immediately she kind of knew what was about to happen, I guess, and she wasn't so sure about it. But the moment I laid my eyes on that little girl, all I could do was weep for joy because I knew that she was mine. And even as I continue to replay that in my mind today, I'm still brought to tears about how much I love that little girl. And, and obviously she looks a little bit different than our biological children. Her hair and her skin is a little bit darker, but there is absolutely no difference in our eyes between she and our other two kids. She is part of our family, and when we die, she'll receive the same thing that our other kids do. And when Paul talks about our adoption into the family of God and now being able to call God Abba, it's an incredible change of position. Our sin once alienated us from God, but because of Christ and our willingness to receive His free offer of grace, we are now His children. We are now part of His intimate family. He has chosen us. And check this out. Paul says, now, no longer do we have to fear God. I, I mean, of course, we always have a reverent and holy fear of God. But according to Paul, we don't have to be a slave to fear. We don't have to wonder if God is just going to crush us at any moment. The principal at my elementary school growing up, his name was Mr. Wills. And Mr. Wills... Uh, he, what our, he, he wasn't a, a, a big man. He wasn't very tall. He seemed huge to me, of course, in elementary school. And he was constantly, as you imagine, a good, any good principal would do, constantly correcting students, keeping us in order. It was a rumor that he had an electric paddle in his office that if anybody who went there and got paddled by him, that it was just 
almost a death penalty. Now, I don't know if he had one or not or if those things even exist or not. I, I kind of doubt it. I was never paddled by him, thankfully. I didn't say I was never paddled. I just was never paddled by him. But, but, but think about it like this. Mr. Wills was a feared man, especially to all us boys who were, seemed to be getting into trouble often. And when you saw him in the hallway, you slowed down, you straightened up, you stopped talking or else, right? But this same man, whom all of us kids feared, would go home each night to his wife and his children, his family, to a totally different response. And his kids, probably like my kids did when they were younger, would greet him at the door, run up to him, <coughs> excuse me, run up to him, hug his legs, so happy to see him. <coughs> well, what made the difference? Well, the difference was they were his children. They were in a relationship, and that made all the difference in the world. And if you are in Christ, you are a child of God. And you don't have to fear His punishment. You don't have to fear His wrath. He's given you His spirit of adoption, which allows you to call Him Father, Abba, Daddy. And as a result, one day you're going to receive an inheritance that only a child can receive. Look at this one more thing, one more reason you can be confident this morning that you're a child of God. You can be confident because God's Spirit bears witness for you. Look at verse 16. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in His sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. See, Hebrew law prescribed that the mouth, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, every matter would be established. Kind of just very similar to, to our court system today. My word against your word, well, that may not be enough, right? But if I have a witness for the case, well, then the odds are going to be pretty good. It's going to be pretty strong. And when it comes to our salvation, we have two witnesses. Not only ourselves, but Paul says, but the Holy Spirit of God testifies on our behalf. And let's be honest, He is the only one who really matters. He is our guarantee for salvation. Paul says it like this in 2 Corinthians 1.21. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ he anointed us, set His seal of ownership on us, and put His Spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. If you've ever entered into a contract with someone, you know the language that Paul's using here as he talks about the Holy Spirit being our deposit. Maybe you bought a house or maybe a piece of property. And as you did, you had to put some money down on that property in order to hold it, right? Right? That money is called earnest. It literally means it's a, it's a deposit. And so maybe you put $1,000 down on a property while you go get approved for a loan or maybe while inspections are being made. But that earnest money is to signify that you're willing to make this down payment because you want the house or the property. And after you take care of business, you're going to come back and you're going to make the full purchase price. Well, the Holy Spirit, Paul says, is our earnest. He is our deposit. He is our guaranteed. We have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, and one day we're promised that He's going to return for His purchase. He's going to return for the church. And the Spirit of God testifies to that on our behalf. How cool is that? I mean, friends, if you're in Christ, you can be confident of your salvation. Our salvation isn't about us. It's not about what we've done. It's, not, it's about what has been given to us freely through Jesus. If you are in Christ, you have been adopted into the family of God. Let me close with a story. I, I think I've shared this before, but it fits really well into this context. Lee Strobel tells a, a story that took place shortly after the Korean War. And a Korean woman had had an affair with an American soldier. 
Long story short, the woman had gotten pregnant, and, and he had to go back to the United States, and she never saw him again. But she gave birth to a little girl, and this little girl didn't look like all the other Korean children. She had curly hair, and her brown eyes were shaped like her father's. And the little girl was ruthlessly taunted by the people. They called her one of the ugliest words in Korean language. It literally meant alien devil. It didn't take long for this little girl to draw some conclusions about herself based on the way people treated her. Well, her mother tried to raise her the best that she could, and for seven years she tried to do that until the rejection was just too much. And this mother did something that you and I, most people probably could never imagine doing. She abandoned the little girl to the streets. And for two years, this little seven-year-old lived as a beggar, as a scavenger, until finally she made her way into an orphanage where she found some sort of refuge. Well, one day came, or, or excuse one word, one day rather, word came that an American couple was arriving to an adopt a, a, a child at the orphanage. And all the children in the orphanage got really excited because at least one of them was going to have hope. At least one of them was going to have a family. And so this little girl, she was nine years old at the, now at this time, she spent the entire day cleaning up the other children rather than getting, you know, prettier up herself because, well, for, you know, for one reason, she was the oldest, and that was part of her responsibility. But for the other reason is that uh, most of the time, most adoptions, were, you know, most people wanted a younger child. And so she spent her day giving all the other kids baths, combing their hair, wondering which one was going to be adopted by the American couple. And when the couple arrived, this is what she recalled. These are her words. She said, it was like Goliath had come back to life. I saw the man with his huge hands as he would touch and play with every child. And it seemed that he loved every one of them as if they were his own. She said, I saw tears running down his face, and I knew that if he could, this couple, if they could, they'd, they'd take the whole lot home with them. He saw me out of the corner of his eye. Now let me tell you, she said, I was nine years old, but I didn't look like it. I was a scrawny thing. I had worms in my body and lice falling out of my hair. I had sores on my body and face. I was not a pretty sight. She said, but then the man came over to me and said something in English. I looked up to him. I looked up at him. And then he took his huge hand and laid it on my face. What was he saying? He was saying, I want this child. This is the child for me. And the God of all heaven says the same thing about you. See, I, I've got good news to share with you today that no matter where you are or how ugly your sin may be, you have a heavenly Father who has an outstretched arm who invites you today to call Him Daddy. No more fear, no more doubt, just simple trust, like a child with their arms wide open. Can you imagine what your life would look like with that kind of confidence? Can you imagine what your life would be walking in step with the Spirit, walking hand in hand with your Heavenly Father, caring about the things He cares about, ruthlessly eliminating all the things He hates, enjoying and thriving and, and, and pursuing a relationship with Him? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine what life would be like, listen, that's God's will for you. That's what He wants for you. You are missing out. If you're searching for anything else, you're missing it. You're completely missing it. Not only abundant life that you're missing right now, like the life and the, the, that you can have, right, but, but the abundant life waiting on you. I've got a little bookmark in my Bible, and the one I read at home, and uh, Macy, my youngest, gave it to me at, at some point. I, I can't remember. I don't know if she, if she made it at church or what. But on the back of it, she just wrote these words. It says, Daddy. And I was thinking the other day that of all the titles I have, that's my favorite one. But honestly, the most important title in my life isn't Daddy. It's Child. I am a child 
of God. I've been adopted into His family by grace. And His Spirit in me testifies on my behalf. I don't have to fear His wrath. I've got an inheritance coming all because of Jesus. We'd love for you to understand that. We want you to, to, uh, to receive the incredible abundant life that Jesus offers if you'll just reach out to Him. Would you pray with me? God, we thank You that You love us enough to send Jesus. Father, we thank You that You adopt us into Your home, that You make us Your children, and that You promise an incredible inheritance someday. Thank You for our hope and our trust that we don't have to fear, that we can just have confidence in knowing what you have done for us. We love you. We thank you. We pray for any who may be watching today, God, that you just help them to understand this as well. We ask it all in Jesus' name.